And now to our program. Today's program features the Mildred Fish Harnick story, which has long been untold, from her Milwaukee roots to her years at the University of Madison to her defining work in the 1930s as a member of an underground anti-Nazi resistance movement in Berlin. Berlin. John Miskowski, director of Wisconsin Public Television, will talk about the documentary, which recounts Fish Harnick's life of conviction and courage. John currently leads the Six Station Wisconsin Public Television Network. In addition, Wisconsin Public Television producer, Joe Waldinger is here with us, and he will lead the Q&A as a part of today's program. We look forward to the presentation and have made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a way of saying thank you for us today. As we welcome John to the podium, I want to just remind everyone that we will have questions at the end, and there'll be microphones um, circulating around because it's being recorded. So at this time, please welcome John to the podium. Thanks, Michelle, and um, thanks to Carol Toussaint. Carol, who uh, I, I was going to say reminded us that um, this week marks um, uh, Mildred Fish Harnack Day in Wisconsin, but we didn't forget. If I said it that way, I know you'd be a little alarmed. Um, we've alerted all the schools in Wisconsin and uh, shared with them um, the materials that, that, that we've made available to make this project um, um, shared throughout the state. I also want to thank the Connies are here uh, and the funders of this project. Um, you see them listed. Um, this was an unusual project, the Mildred Fish Harnack. Um, Joel uh, had this, came to Wisconsin Public Television with this passion for this amazing story um, uh, with the idea of traveling to Germany and some things that are, are uh, unusual for us. And folks like Babe and Marv, uh, the Weinstein Family Foundation, the Ellie Phillips Foundation, really embraced that idea and made it happen, just as many, many great things uh, happen, uh, because people support them. So I want to start with that thank, and thank you, and thank you for your contribution to Friends of Wisconsin Public Televi Television. Um, this Friday marks Fildred, Mildred Fish Harnack um, Observation Day, or Commemoration Day in Wisconsin schools. It's one of 21 official observation days that include the U.S. Constitution, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Susan B. Anthony, Martin Luther King. So what we're here today is to answer this question, why is Mildred Harnack um, stand next to Lincoln, Washington, Anthony, and uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.? Because it's truly an amazing story of courage. Uh, and I will, uh, again, um, nod to Joel because he did such an extraordinary job uncovering material. As you mentioned, a sort of lost to history. Um, it wasn't simply uh, Joel opening a book or finding a file somewhere that had all the information. Uh, Joel set about really collecting um, an incredible amount of information about Mildred's life uh, and about that time, which is poured in um, to this documentary, but also uh, shared with community groups, um, shared online, and, and really has preserved this important story for Wisconsin and for the United States. Before we get to that, I thought I would uh, start with a 100-year lead-up um, to this story, and hopefully it won't be in real time. Um, so I'm the new director of Wisconsin Public Television. I've been in this position for about a year. Uh, previous to that, I worked at Wisconsin Public Television for 23 years. In this job and before that, really conscious of one thing that we uh, uh, talk a lot and think a lot about at Wisconsin Public Television, and that is that we invented public broadcasting in Wisconsin. Mike Crane, my colleague, and your friend here uh, from Wisconsin Public Radio, my counterpart, um, knows this story very well, so I'm going to steal it from him. Um, but 2017 uh, marks the centennial of public broadcasting in Wisconsin. So if I have this right, that doesn't look right. 
It marks the centennial of public broadcasting in Wisconsin. And I think uh, rather than dwelling on our past, I'm going to give you a little preview. But I want you to think about some of the elements of, of the Mildred Fish Harnack project that really uh, uh, helps define our future and the way we're working. To give you a brief introduction to Mildred and have a little context for the clip we're going to show later, I want to show you this brief introduction to the documentary. Mildred always felt like she was a Wisconsin girl. These people were the heart of the Wisconsin idea. She wrote about the spirit of democracy. When they moved to Berlin, she was a witness to book burnings, beatings in the street. Mildred felt that the Nazis were like a bad dream and it was going to blow over. They underestimated them. These were thugs. They saw the brutality and they saw what happened to the Jews. We're in a political emergency. Mildred says, well, it's not a question of how dangerous it is. I've got work to do. They knew the Gestapo was on their trail. He was called Hitler's bloodhound. People were very afraid. It was too dangerous. She could have left. He wanted this American woman. Suddenly there was a knock on the door. The rage drove a thirst for vengeance. He didn't want any martyrs, he wanted her dead. We can either hide from it or we can engage. So this is such an incredible story that's hard to believe that it hasn't been present um, for all of us, certainly in Wisconsin for a long time. But it, uh, as Joel found as he did research and as he discovered this story in Berlin and wondered why is this, this uh, a marker to a woman from my home state? And as he answered that question, um, led to this documentary and led to some amazing connections among families and scholars uh, and, and understanding a bit of this time and an understanding a bit of Wisconsin history and how that connects. So I'm going to change the subject here a little bit and do this 100-year trip uh, to Mildred Fish Harnack. As I mentioned, um, next year marks the centennial of public broadcasting in Wisconsin, but also public broadcasting in America. Uh, public broadcasting was founded on this campus at UW-Madison. Uh, you know, some, we, 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 there's that phrase, first station in the nation, uh, about um, Wisconsin Public Radio. Um, that's true. Um, some might argue it. Um, part of, one of the reasons it's true, uh, there's a little footnote about during World War I, a lot of the uh, radio stations were put off the air. And uh, WHA radio stayed on the air. Uh, but still, in terms of public broadcasting, it's the very first um, station. Uh, it starts in the, uh, really starts with the Wisconsin idea and that sense of the university's commitment to bringing the learning and the benefit of the campus uh, uh, to all the people in Wisconsin. And clearly, uh, there was that early recognition that broadcasting um, uh, held that possibility. And so our roots began with Earl, on this campus with Earl Terry. Uh, in 1914, who is teaching his students uh, physics um, through radio. Uh, they blew their own glass tubes. Um, uh, uh, they had to, he had to teach himself to blow glass, um, to, to continue to maintain and have tubes that constantly broke. I love the picture on the left because, like, wow, that, that looks like a science fiction film. And they truly were inventing it in that, in that era. And Earl T Terry is one of those founders. And it really comes out of that, uh, again, the investment on this campus of this university of reinventing education and reinventing public service. Um, from, very, from the very beginning, there's also this, this service to the public, service to large audience through broadcast, but also a commitment to education. So that's one element I want to use and, and, and focus on here. You know the broadcast well. You know about our news and history uh, and um, uh, political coverage and things like that. What's less known is our continuing work um, with schools. It starts in 1931. Uh, you probably could guess it. It starts with music. Um, something that's certainly in radio uh, it has a, a very strong focus. And there is Pop Gordon. Uh, for folks who grew up in Wisconsin, even as old as I am, remember uh, uh, music classes coming to, in mine, it was in fifth grade, it was Sister Venantia uh, coming through the box uh, of that Wisconsin public radio music class in our classroom. That started with Pop Gordon. Um, and that enormous project. There's a really wonderful video on YouTube 
of his career and that uh, UW put together. Uh, and you might know him from Gordon Commons. This is, that's our Edgar Pop Gordon. In addition to that, I, I love to share this um, program, Let's Draw, because I'm still fascinated with the idea that someone decided to do an art program on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> that takes some energy and creativity and some madness as well, I think. But I, 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 was, I was sort of fascinated with this. And I found someone did a master's paper on early broadcasting and education. I don't know if this is true, but it cited that at one point in the 50s, 120,000 classrooms in, was, in, in, the, in the country were using, was, were using Let's Draw in the classroom. So it's a pretty amazing um, legacy. I wanted to, so this work continues. And in fact, we have a Young Performers Initiative that you maybe see on broadcasts on things like the Final Forte, on um, programs like um, uh, the, from the Overture Center, um, the Tommy Awards. But in addition to that, we're uh, continuing uh, Pop Gordon's legacy by providing curriculum for teachers. Teachers who are quite stressed, teachers are expected to do everything, uh, and uh, we provide them tools and, and connections with other teachers um, uh, um, to help them um, do better work. So, in addition, that work continues. Um, we have uh, uh, materials um, for teachers that are about Wisconsin, that teachers use in hundreds of thousands of uh, downloads each year of drawing on the materials for Wisconsin Public Television, including a biography of Mildred Harnack. So, um, So I want to. So when you hear anything on NPR, when you hear anything from PBS, that is rooted in the Wisconsin idea. That's rooted on this campus. That's rooted in Wisconsin because uh, we invented it. Now in 1954, uh, WHA TV came on the air, and it wasn't the very first public television station. Um, but but uh, Boris Frank, who was on the original staff, a lot of people know will tell folks that while it wasn't the first, there were one or two public television stations that really led and invented public television. And WHA-TV was that. And so we, Mike and I, are really mindful of this legacy of bringing it forward and also continuing to reinvent um, the work that we do. So on to Mildred Harnick. Let's see what this button will do, what we will see next. So I'm going to, um, as I mentioned, Joel has been working on this uh, project for many years. He uh, had done some work before he came to Wisconsin Public Television. Uh, I remember seeing you present uh, this extraordinary uh, story that really motivated all of us to, um, to get this done. Um, and so Mildred Harnack, uh, as you heard, I uh, was born in Milwaukee, uh, came to UW. At UW, met her husband. Um, her husband moved back to Germany, and she joined him after they married in 1929. And so you can imagine going to Germany in 1929 and into the 30s and into the beginning of the World War of, of World War One of World War Two, uh, what they were about to face. Um, and, and, and we want to share that story with you. Um, and then also I'll do, Joel will join me after the, join, uh, come to the podium after the clip. So you can um, ask him questions. He'll give you a little more background. Um, Joel is uh, the producer, as I mentioned, has been working on this for a long time. Um, he's also a producer on Wisconsin Life, whose new season is coming up. He's also a producer on Around the Farm Table with Ingo Witcher, which is a great favorite. Ingo is wonderful to work with. Um, so. This is about nine minutes of an in, in the heart of, uh, of Mildred's story in Germany. Thanks. During its investigation, the Gestapo labeled the resistance network the Rote Kapelle, or Red Orchestra, Red being a communist moniker. The Gestapo only linked uh, the group to the Soviet Union, but the Gestapo has no idea that Avid Mildred Harnack also has close context to members of the United States Embassy here in Berlin. 
Arvind Harnack was not going to admit he passed on information to the Americans. Why would he do that? They were not going to admit that since it was illegal to get Jews out of the country, they were not going to say, well, yeah, and by the way, we helped a number of Jews escape. The trials began in December 1942 at the highest military court where justice wasn't blind. And a death sentence was almost assured. An Air Force prosecutor named Manfred Röder was called Hitler's bloodhound. And he even shocked the military judges with how bloodthirsty he was in demanding the death sentence for every possible case. The trials shrouded in secrecy. Often family members weren't even told. The entire process was, was a joke, a very bad, tragic joke. In many cases, they met with their lawyers for five minutes before they were tried. Muldred and Arvid Harnock were tried early on. It was pretty clear that they were going to be dealt with harshly. Arvid would be sentenced to death for high treason and espionage. The defense would argue Mildred simply acted on her husband's orders. Mildred's sentence, six years in prison. With the help of eyewitnesses, Arvid's cousin documented what happened next. Dr. Harnack, looking straight at his wife, was radiant. He insisted that because of that sentence, her life had been saved, for she would be able to serve that term or even surely be liberated before then. Arvid's sister, Inga, waited outside to get details for the family. My dear mama, the court-martial pronounced the cruel verdict. Although we all secretly expected it, it was still a blow. I want to urge you again not to give up hope. Two days later, Hitler personally signed Arvid's death sentence. The night before his execution, Arvid wrote a farewell letter. Within the next hours, I will depart this life. I would like to thank you all again for all your love which you have shown me. So, I am calm and happy. Tonight I will hold a small pre-Christmas celebration and I will read aloud the Christmas story. And then comes the moment of departing. Your Arvid. The next day, Arvid was handcuffed and taken into a small building at Plotzensee Prison. The prosecutor, Manfred Roder, witnessed the special punishment Hitler had ordered. He decided to have these meat hooks put up in Plötzensee at the prison. Overhead, the newly installed meat hooks, Arvid would hang by a short rope, a Nazi torture tactic to prolong his suffering. It was a private revenge of Hitler against these people. Arvid's petition to see Mildred one last time had been denied. Arvid went to his death not knowing Hitler refused to sign Mildred's prison sentence and had ordered a retrial. I think that the rage drove a, a thirst for vengeance that Hitler felt personally. He wanted this American woman. He didn't want any martyrs. He wanted her dead. Manfred Roder wanted to make a name for himself, so it was extremely embarrassing when Hitler demanded a new trial. Determined to follow orders, Roder cautioned the Harnack family not to interfere. I urgently warn the Harnack family not to undertake anything whatsoever in favor of this woman. She no longer belongs to your family. Especially hard words for Arvid's sister, who recalled Mildred's journey into the resistance. She shared his turbulent life, waited for him for nights on end. Filled with fear, anxiety, she even ran through the dark city streets to meet him. She became an active member of her husband's resistance group, to which she dedicated her life. So had Libertas Schulzeboisen. Now isolated and alone, prison proved harsh for Libertas and Mildred. She tried to give some letters to Libertas Schulzeboisen, who was there at that time. She's letters, small letters, small illegal letters were found and used as evidence in the trial against Mildred Hanak. Mildred appeared to buckle under the pressure without Arvid. And with little new evidence, she was sentenced to death. Mildred Harnack, prisoner 228, returned to the bricks 
bars, and now a death row cell. I think she was treated very harshly. She tried to commit suicide at one point by swallowing pins, and she became very thin, her hair turned white. Mildred was assigned a cellmate to keep an eye on her. Gertrude Lichtenstein lived to write Arvid's mother about Mildred's time in prison. Sometimes she wept when she talked about Arvid and his fate. I had to leave Mildred for a concentration camp. The same day, she went to trial where she received the death sentence. And that was the very moment she needed me most. She almost lost her mind, I think. She was running around the courtyard, someone reported, just sort of scurrying around at one point. The only evidence against losing her mind was she was translating Gertrude in her cell, maybe to keep her mind. Mildred had sustained herself with a stub of a pencil, translating a book of Goethe poems. Probably she felt happy to have these Goethe poems. Mildred's final translations, scribbled in the margin, are from the poem Vermechnis, or The Legacy. She crossed out things. You mean, you, you, you feel she was in a rush. And I could imagine that this is her legacy. And the final line Mildred translated, Your place is with a chosen few. As a cold rain blanketed Berlin, a prison van delivered Mildred down a cobblestone street to Platzensee Prison, where the Nazi tools of death were housed. The prison chaplain, Harold Polschau, was a family friend he was deeply touched by her personality, by her confidence. The pastor described how, at age 40, Mildred was so starved, so broken after five months of Nazi interrogations, she could no longer stand upright. He gave Mildred a Bible, and she read, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Pastor Polshow brought Mildred an orange he had smuggled in the prison along with a picture of her mother. Mildred remained strong until she saw this photo. Her eyes filled with tears. Mildred kissed the picture again and again. On the back, she wrote, The face of my mother expresses everything I want to say at this moment. This face was with me all through these last months. The chaplain broke the news to Mildred. Arvid had been executed on December 22nd, her mother's birthday. He told Mildred about Arvid's death and how he died and what were on his lips and that he, he believed he prayed to the power of love. Mildred remembers in her death cell. Arvid remembers in his death cell. Run their rowing boats reciting Goethe and Whitman. They shared this happiness to their very last moment on this planet. Maybe they still share it. With hands cuffed behind her back, two guards led Mildred into a brick shed. A curtain was pulled back, revealing the guillotine. On February 16, 1943, inside an execution room that looked more like a chapel, Mildred Fishharnack was strapped to a bench and guillotined at 6.57 p.m. The Nazis would note it took Mildred seven seconds to die. The only American woman ever executed on the direct orders of Adolf Hitler. Her last words? Und ich habe Deutschland so gali. And I have loved Germany so much. So... That's the middle of the Mildred Fish Harnack story. Um, I wanted to mention that you might have recognized the voice, the narrator in that documentary. That's Jane Kaczmarek, who is from the Fox show Malcolm in the Middle. She's a, uh, also born in Milwaukee and a UW-Madison grad. 
When we were looking for a narrator for the documentary, we had looked at some other actresses and put out some feelers, and we called Jane, and whether it was serp serendipity or not, Jane said, you're not going to believe this, but when I was a student, I read something in the alumni magazine, and I cut it out. It was about Mildred Fish Harnack, and my brother just gave me a book about her. Of course, I'll come and do it, and she donated her own time, flew to Madison on her own dime, and we spent the day with her narrating the documentary. So, um, you know, we're, we're grateful to to Jane, and also I wanted to mention in the beginning of the documentary, it really gets into their, their days in Madison and how it formed this bond between Mildred and Arvid that they took to Germany. They were part of the Friday Nighters, which was a progressive group in the 1920s on campus. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright was a member of that group as well. Mildred went on to have a teaching career at Berlin University. She was very well known in Berlin circles. That's also the university that Albert Einstein went to. They were on the faculty at the same time. Not only on the faculty, he came and listened to her lectures about America and about Madison. So Madison was very crucial in the formation of this resistance group in, uh, in Berlin. Um, I know there's a lot, of, a lot of things at the beginning and the end that we weren't able to show you. Um, this is, takes place about 30 minutes into the hour-long documentary, so there's 20 minutes or so left after this, which really gets into how Mildred Fish Harnack and her husband became part of the Cold War and propaganda and the McCarthy era. There's a lot of interesting elements with the CIA and the FBI and the KGB all involved in this case. It's truly a story of a lifetime for a journalist um, to help uncover and reveal and dig for these, these documents. So with that being said, I know there might be questions, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah. So it debuted in 2011. Uh, the question was, when, when did this air on Wisconsin Public Television, or when will it air again? I don't know when it will air again, but it debuted in 2011. But the good thing is, it's online for free. There are bookmarks back at the table there that you can go online, even if you just searched Wisconsin's Nazi resistance, it will come up. And you can watch the whole documentary for free, along with a lot of web extras of information that we weren't able to include in the documentary as well. Yeah. Tell us, if you would, uh, about the, her Madison experience. It was interesting, as you agree. Yeah, well, Mildred, when she was a senior in high school, her mom actually moved to Washington, D.C. to live with Mildred's sister. And Mildred started college in Washington, but she was a Wisconsin girl. She wanted to come home to Madison, go to UW-Madison like her sisters did. So she came here. She was in the English department and then stayed on a year later. She had met Arvid completely by accident. He was here um, on a Rockefeller scholarship wandered into the long lecture room, saw this beautiful woman giving a lecture, didn't understand what she was saying. She didn't speak German, he didn't speak English, but he went up to her afterwards. He was so mesmerized by her and he said, you know, I'll help you learn German if you help me learn English. And they were married within six months. He wrote in his farewell letter about their canoe rides out to Picnic Point. You might have noticed some of those pictures. Um, their first conversations on State Street he lived in the university club at the bottom of Bascom Hill. Uh, he was headed for Sterling Hall and got into Bascom Hall somehow where she was lecturing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really truly a love story when it comes right down to it. Can you give us a sample of some of the things she did that were part of the resistance? Yeah, well, un unlike the Nazis, the resistance didn't keep track of everything that they did for obvious reasons. They all had code names, so your neighbor might have a code name and you didn't even know your neighbor was in the group. But what Mildred did was she was a translator, so she had U.S. passports. She could travel around um, Europe. And we know that she helped Jews escape. We don't know exactly how. We know that she smuggled jewels out of um, Germany for a Jewish family that uh, one of the gentlemen later wrote about this. Um, we also know that she gave food and medicine to her Jewish friends uh, there. They also provided military information. That was one of the keys that this group provided. Um, there were also 18 women in this group that were executed. Women had the key roles in this group of transporting secret information once they obtained it. Um, Mildred also was tutoring a German soldier uh, because he believed that if the Germans uh, beat the British, 
that English would be a, a skill to have. And so she was teaching this German soldier English and at the same time getting military information from him because he just liked her. And so she was passing that on to the US Embassy. Um, it, it, it gets into it a little bit more. But she was also a tutor. It was a little bit dangerous to go to the US Embassy after a while. So she was tutoring the first ambassador's son. And the son would deliver that information back and forth between the embassy and the Harnax. Um, as a UW faculty member, did she get involved at all in investigating the German American Bund in Wisconsin, which was particularly active in Milwaukee? It should be pointed out that Governor Julius Heil was a very active member of the German American Bund at one time. Yeah, I'm not certain. I know she grew up in Milwaukee, and there were 13 newspapers, German newspapers at the time she was growing up. I mean, German culture was the culture of Milwaukee at that time. Um, I'm not. I'm not certain what her involvement it was after that. Hi, uh, Roberta Gassman. Thank you so much for the presentation. Do you know if the State Department or the United States in any way tried to intervene in saving her as an American? Yeah, at that point the U.S. Embassy was already closed. All staff had left. So while she was a U.S. citizen and had a passport, there was no real way to rescue her, it's, it's believed. Um, the U.S. State Department during the McCarthy era, though, did investigate and said that um, her her Espionage or whatever was not done officially on behalf of the U.S. government, so the U.S. government has never officially recognized Mildred and Harvard Harnack's contributions. I have a question and, and a, a small announcement. Um, at UW-Madison, there is an annual named lecture after Mildred Fish Harnett, and it happens to be coming up on sep uh, September 28th in the Pyle Center at 4 p.m. if you want to write that down. And I'm on the, I'm, I happen to be working with the human rights scholars who um, select the speaker. So I'll tell you that it's uh, Viviana Kristasevich, and she's from the Center for Justice and International Law in DC, originally from Argentina. And they always try to highlight people who are working in the spirit of Mildred Fish Harnack. Um, and I did not know that she translated poetry. So I'm wondering, is that book in the library somewhere in Madison, or what? And has anything been done with with those translations? To me, to to translate poetry through your suffering is just an incredible coping strategy, and that was what spoke to me from the yeah. piece we saw. The Goethe Book of Poems is actually in the German Resistance Center in Berlin. Um, but we do have a lot of the stories that she wrote about Madison uh, online that you can actually go online and read. And as a journalist and someone who's trying to track down information, it was really important to know that Mildred wrote about her life in her stories. But she didn't use her name or any of the people around her, their names. She wrote about meeting this guy in the Baltic, going out to, to a, a picnic point, sitting on the rocks, getting sunburned. And he wanted to kiss her, and she pushed him away. And that night, she heard pebbles on her window. And she looked out, and here was this German blonde-haired guy standing in the yard. And you're reading it going, oh, that's Arvid. That's got to be him. But she used the name Rudolph. And you're like, Rudolph? Who was that? Arvid's middle name is Rudolph. So one more question. Yeah, sir. Um, thank you for your presentation. Do you know uh, there's a designation, a, pers a righteous person? Uh, has she been nominated or has she been designated as a righteous person for she, her rescuing Jews? Right. She has not been nominated as far as I'm aware. So no, she has not been. Sounds like uh, she's deserving. Yeah. yeah, very much so. Thank you very much for having us here today. Thank you, Carol, for inviting us as well. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, John and Joel. This meeting is adjourned.